it's William Petrie. Uh, I am substituting for Dan Milstein, who unfortunately cannot make it. And I'm here to talk about uh, lean startups and how you survive them. So a little bit of background for you guys on me. I am a total nerd. I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I've been living in San Francisco since Bubble 1.0. Uh, my nerdery comes by birth. My father and my stepmother are both software developers, and my dad started coding in 1968. So if computers have any strange radiation that influences children like from before birth, I have that problem. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. My mom's side of the family is entrepreneurs generations back. Uh, I've done five companies so far, and I'm experimenting right now to see if I can make a sixth. And I also uh, turned up here in, started working out here in 1997. And so I've seen the whole cycle of the dot-com bubble, the subsequent crash, and the new rise of all these shiny new startup stuff. And personally, I think this is bubble 2.0, and we'll be having another big crash in startups in a few years. So uh, I'm excited for that, because that clears out some of the dead wood. So what I want to talk about today uh, is what makes lean startups different from other startups. And there are a lot of things, but I want to focus on what makes them sustainable. Because as with Bubble 1.0, there was a lot of stuff that totally could not survive. And as soon as the, the financial weather changed a little, a lot of companies disappeared, not because they were terrible ideas and not because they didn't have an audience, but because they didn't have their acts together in important ways. Uh, the things I'd like to talk about, uh, or focusing on, are the relationship between temporary and sustainable code, uh, uh, like how manual and automated testing plays into that, and how you make a company's culture that supports sustainability. <laughs> so before I get into that, I want to find out how many people here consider themselves technical people? Sweet. How many people here consider themselves business people? Awesome. I'm glad to see some hands in both. I love those people. They're my people. Uh, how many people are doing a startup right now? Good. How many people are thinking about doing one soon? OK, good. So like, a lot of entrepreneurs in this room, which is just what I was hoping for. So one of the essential facts about startups is that they take time. This is a graph of median time from uh, venture capital investment to a uh, mergers and acquisitions exit. And you can see that that's changed a fair bit over time, that like back in the bubble days, it was down at, like as low as two years right before everything blew up. It climbed to seven years, and now it's back circa like, five or uh, back circa five years. Now, these are only companies that have taken VC money, and they're only companies that have done a mergers and acquisitions exit. There are other companies that take even longer. Like if you're doing an IPO, the road is much longer than that. And if you're not selling yourself, and you're not doing an IPO, and you're not blowing up, then your company will hopefully be running forever as an independent entity. So. Startups feel very quick and very panicked, and a lot of them do die quickly. But if you want yours to actually survive, you really need to be thinking about a time scale that extends into the decades. Now, a way people often express this is saying that it's a sprint, it's not a marathon. I think this is a terrible way to express it. Uh, but to explain why, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the Midwest. I'm a Michigander by birth. And I moved out here from Chicago. And there are many good things about those places, but with six months of winter a year, there is not the same focus on health. When I came out here to San Francisco, I was dumbfounded that everybody was active and sporty all the time, biking and kayaking and running and kite surfing and actual surfing. It just blew me away that everybody I knew was doing something like that. Whereas in Chicago, the main sports were drinking and eating out. So uh, I was... I kind of got sucked into this culture, and I was looking around for something to do when I heard about something called Beta Breakers. And this is a race that runs along this blue line here, like straight across San Francisco. It is uh, seven and a half miles, about 12K. And this race now has been running for, I think, 102 years at this point. It's uh, one of the oldest uh, continuously running foot races in the country. And it is not only a San Francisco institution, but it is done in San Francisco style. There are a zillion, like this is a shot of the hill looking back. People dress up in insane costumes. The first runners are very serious runners, but many of the ones who follow on are less serious to the point that they will be pulling 
uh, floats that they have kegs on. Last year there was a lovely Pope mobile. I saw three different Golden Gate bridges with like several different people each holding a chunk of their Golden Gate bridge. Uh, all sorts of insanity. And so when I moved out here, I'm like, oh, that's a sport I can get behind. If it involves drinking and tomfoolery, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And so I started training. Uh, that's me crossing the finish line of my first Data Breakers uh, in the pirate outfit. And uh, the first year I did it, I actually, a friend was having a party on the route. There are many parties on the route. And so I stopped and I had an hour of tequila sunrises before I finished my race. My time wasn't very good. <laughs> but that got me into it, and uh, the way it works out is that um, uh, uh, you know, I, like I finished a number of races, and what got me really going was that they were coming up on their hundredth, so I committed to doing five years of races there. Uh, let's see here, I'm a little off on my slide. Oh yes, not quite there. Sorry. And so, uh, like, when people talk about it's a sprint, not a marathon, for me getting to this level of fitness and running, it was much longer than a marathon. I spent years doing a lot of patient practice, learning how not to injure myself, learning how to drag myself out of bed when it was dark and raining and still actually do a run. Now, the thing that is pernicious about marathons, I don't know if you folks probably all have friends like this. I have friends who decided they wanted to do a marathon and they had not really run much before. They got out there, they trained on a relatively short schedule Many of them injured themselves or quit during the training. The ones who made it to the race often ended up looking this sad by the end of it. They, and easily three quarters of my friend who, friends who have done marathons have never done a race again after doing the marathon. It was too painful, it was too unpleasant, it was unsustainable. And so to me, doing a startup is much more like my experience becoming a lifelong runner than it is uh, doing a marathon. And what I want to talk about is how you do that with code. Now, there are three kinds of code, and those here are not programmers. Uh, nobody will tell you this. Your employees will certainly not tell you this because you don't want to hear it. And this is something that all programmers really know, and it's a secret I'm maybe not supposed to give away, but what the hell. Uh, kind one is temporary code. This is the stuff where you, ex you plan to throw it away. Uh, One-liners, quick scripts little data transformations. And one of the ways you can tell that it's really temporary code is that if it breaks, people are like, oh yeah, fuck it, it was temporary code. <laughs> if it breaks and people are like, oh no, 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 then you know it's a different kind of code. They were thinking it is sustainable code. Now this is code that you are really intending it to be around indefinitely. Uh, it's well factored, it's well understood by the team. There are good automated tests and it generally meets the team standards for something that they'd be happy working with forever. Now, temporary code is a small portion of what developers do. It turns out sustainable code is sadly a small portion because the third kind is the largest one, and that is half-assed code. This is code where you believe for business reasons it should be sustainable, but for whatever reason you are not doing supporting practices, you are not committed to making it uh, permanent code. And a good way you can tell this is like, oh, we'll clean it up later. Uh, later never actually comes or almost never comes, unless you have a very specific structured process where there is a later already in the schedule and you booked it uh, at the same time you're creating the technical debt. So these lessons took me a long time to learn, and I want to give you three different startup stories to illustrate the learning process for me. The first one was in 2004. Uh, it was my first time trying all the extreme programming practices together, the first time I had a team where I could do as I pleased, and it was extraordinary. Unlike previous projects, we were, like, we had releasable builds every week. The, everybody was very happy with the progress. We had full unit and acceptance test coverage. Our total test suite ran in under three seconds. Our page rendering times were on the order of five milliseconds. Like, we were immensely happy with this as a technical p achievement. Uh, and then we got to the end of the period of constructing it, and our, the person who was funding it and the CEO uh, was, were trying to raise money. They could not raise money. We had no users. And so after nine months of effort, which was a delightful and beautiful effort, uh, we were done. Nobody gave a shit. And this made me immensely sad as a developer. I hate writing things that turn out to be pointless. Now, I, I used to enjoy that as a youth, but now if I can spend the time just like drinking beer and hanging out on the beach instead of writing stuff that I'll throw away, I'll take the beach. 
So this stuck in the back of my head as a lesson that I knew I hadn't quite learned. I didn't know what went wrong, but I knew something went wrong. That in 2007, I helped some friends start a company called SideReel. Uh, this was something where like, the, the C, uh, a bunch of people worked together at a company. The CEO, after the Christmas party at 3 in the morning, sent an email that I suspect was uh, drug-influenced, uh, insulting almost each person in the company by name, like saying he, he reordered the company you know, like December 19th after everybody is still like either drunk or hungover from the Christmas party. This did not win him any friends and half the company quit the next day. Uh, some of them went on to found SideReel and these were people who had not been planning to do a startup, just opportunity was thrust upon them. And they also had like bank accounts and spouses and children and so they didn't have a lot of time to do anything. They felt this immense pressure watching their bank balance tick down week by week. And so by force of necessity, they were, ended up doing what I now recognize as a very lean approach to things. We, took, like, we talked about the product we wanted. We uh, put a big table out and laid out index cards with every possible feature that everybody thought was necessary. And then, since this was at one of the co-founder's houses, he went and got his big jar of change, and we all got pennies, and we went and voted on the things that were necessary. And then the programmers were like, oh yeah, that's gonna take a long time. So people went and started pulling off pennies and reorganizing. And eventually they got down to a very tiny slice of product, what I would now recognize as a minimum viable product. And they were so aggressive about cutting features that this was a community site Users were supposed to contribute a lot of data, and they did, but they didn't include accounts or logging in. The way they, people got credit was just by typing their name a little, in a little box and it would show up in the page logs. So like, they were so aggressive that they cut out what seem fundamentals if you start with a notion of like, oh, we're building a real thing. And so they had a prototype, or a, it was really a private alpha out in uh, two months, a, a public, uh, I, I'm sorry, a, a, private beta in three, and then they were live in four months. Uh, and then this site went on to uh, grow to millions and millions of users. It sold to a company called Rovi for tens of millions of dollars in uh, just three short years. Now, that sounds like a great success story, and it is, but they came very close to dying because they had the opposite problem of my 2004 startup. They were not sustainable in their code practices, and so at the point where they were talking to, about selling to people, they were in a place, uh, like the code base was in a sad state. They had to spend four months totally rewriting things. Uh, and it, they're very lucky that they had an indulgent audience, that their competitors were weak and sickly, and that their investors were cool with this because otherwise they could have ended up shutting down and totally missing startup victory, the uh, acquisition. So that again nagged at me. And then in 2009, I uh, was reading Eric Reese's blog and a lot of the lean startup stuff that he was talking about, I was like, of course, this puts it all together. Sustainability, but minimal feature sets. And so uh, that led me to realize that you can use temporary code to test a lot of your hypotheses, but you use sustainable code whenever you're building something that you expect to be deriving long-term value from. So in 2010, uh, a friend of mine, a brilliant product manager and user tester, was like, hey, I've got this idea, let's do a little experimenting. And our initial pokes at it looked fine. He started looking around for money. Uh, and we found uh, some venture capitalists who were willing to write us a, uh, what was for them a small check and what was for us a quite substantial check. The notion of this company was that if, uh, that the way people buy things involves their real world social networks. We all have online social networks, but by and large, we don't use them for purchasing. Uh, people mainly trust Amazon reviews or traditional reviews. And there's a lot of knowledge in your social network, especially, one, two, especially two degrees out, that you don't tap when you make a purchasing decision. And I love this because I personally despise advertising. I want it to die. People spend about half a trillion dollars each year in the US trying to get you to buy whatever they want you to buy. And if, I thought that if we could get you using your social networks to make these deci decisions, we could possibly uh, make advertising less valuable. So uh, we tried this out. And in particular, we did some experiments around putting things in your Facebook news feed, like, oh, Sam just bought an iPad. Uh, 
And the way we were going to do this was in an automated fashion by pulling data from your Amazon and, or like from your email account. We look at the receipts and be like, oh, we'll just throw that right up on Facebook for you. We thought it was brilliant. And uh, then we did some, we spent about six weeks doing prototypes. People would come into our user testing booth. They would log on to uh, our laptop and we would, they would log on to their real Facebook accounts. We would steal names and photos from elsewhere in Facebook, put up fake purchasing things so that it looked like your real friends were posting their purchases. And we discovered people hated this. Hated, hated, hated. Like 15% of people thought it was great and thought it was really interesting. Most people were like, what is that doing in my feed? Like, God, that Bob guy's a jerk. And that is not the reaction you want to see when you are shipping a product. And so uh, after six weeks of user test was our first board meeting. And in case you folks aren't around, from around here, Sand Hill Road is where Silicon Valley keeps all its money. That's where the investors hang out. And so we like, and when you want the money, you go to them. So we went down for our first board meeting and went to this very nice conference room, a marble table, and a very well put together administrative person brought us little plates of fruit. And uh, you know, I, I live in the mission, and uh, it's a good day when I like I wear pants. And so it was all a little intimidating to me as a technical person. Uh, and we sit down, and my co-founder explains to them that that brilliant idea that they just gave us money for it's dumb and it's not going to work, and he doesn't know why he gave money. He doesn't actually say that because he's not a programmer, and he instead smooth talks his way through and says, oh, well, we actually, of our five core hypotheses, two of them were wrong, and this is what we've learned, and here's our new product. And so we went on to do this to them six times. Uh, we, about uh, four to six weeks each, we'd be like, oh, okay, we've got a brilliant new idea that's gonna change the world. And then we would test it out and find some reason why, like, oh yeah, actually, this is totally ridiculous and it's not gonna work. The seventh product, uh, Need Feed, was what the company turned into. Uh, this did work out in the small term user tests. Uh, and it, like, every one of these is a very difficult experience for us because we, we really believed in it and then we were failures. And we believed it and we were failures. Uh, Kent Beck calls this the genius shithead roller coaster. And let me tell you, we took a lot of rides on the genius shithead roller coaster. So, oh, whoops, they're videotaping so I can't shouldn't be wandering around like that. So uh, we like our eventual product, we launched it and we got to about half a million users, but for ridiculous reasons relating to like Facebook virality growth and the investment climate at the time, we never got the funding to take it further. So that one sadly also didn't work, but at least we got to something that uh, wasn't an obvious failure. Uh, and then, but we'd always wondered what it was our original idea any good? Like, we, maybe we quit it after six weeks. Like, maybe we shouldn't have quit after six weeks. Maybe we should have kept going. And then, like, there were two competitors at the time, companies called Blippi and Swipely. They, between them, raised $20 million, and they spent more than a year testing that initial idea that we killed very quickly. And after a year, each one of them admitted failure, and one of them was like, oh, yeah, we don't think want to pe people want to share their purchases, period. And so what... Uh, we had spent seven weeks and about 70K learning. Uh, those two companies each spent nine months or a year and several million dollars. So although we failed, we did it at one one hundredth the price of our competitors. And that was very exciting for us. That was a great aha moment for me that, yes, you can do this stuff and it really works. Oh my goodness, I'm a little, oh, I'm sorry, what time is it here? How much time do I have? Oh, okay, good. The clock on my screen here is off, and I thought I only had like five minutes left. Whew. Okay, so in these stories, I really learned that temporary code was immensely valuable, uh, that we could use it to test ideas cheaply, and that writing was easy. But at the point when we found something that we thought was going to work and wanted to scale it up, it was really hard to throw it away. It was the natural desire of everybody in the room to be like, well, this code, it's kind of bad, but we could just keep going on it. And in retrospect, it was absolutely the right decision to throw every bit of our prototype away and build it from scratch uh, using all of the techniques that we knew were good approaches to make sustainable code. So in sustainable code, I feel like the, one of the key elements for us was automating our tests. We had excellent unit tests, and we had reasonably good end-to-end -end acceptance tests using a browser automation framework. We really controlled our pace. 
that was vital for us. The typical startup nonsense is that you work 70, 80, 100 hours a week. And we felt, uh, having been startup veterans, that that was basically, it felt macho and it was a waste of everybody's time. And we also had to write our code for maintainability. Uh, the idea of your company is continuously changing, and so for us that meant a fair bit of refactoring, a lot of focus on small composable units so that we could, uh, as ideas change, we could easily make the code keep up. So let me dive into these three ideas. Uh, the first one is automated testing. Now, how many, here, how many people here actually do a lot of automated testing at your company? All right, and how many people here would like to do it, but bosses are skeptical that it's worth the effort? Okay, only one, all right, that's unusual. Uh, in that case, a lot of you haven't, like, uh, the pitch is mainly for this gentleman here, and then for the ones who don't even know yet that it's worth doing. Think about uh, a graph where you've got time, and you've got a constant number of developers. Now, as those developers are working away, they are going to produce code at some rate, so you're always gonna have more code over time. Now, if you were manually testing, the testing effort is proportional to the amount of code you have. So over time, that goes up. And so as your project lives on, there are three possibilities. One is that you've automated everything, and so that that's fine. Another is that you are manually testing everything, and your QA staff, you're continually hiring more QA people, so that eventually QA is the very largest department in the company. Uh, never heard of that happening, but that would be a theoretical necessity of manual testing. What actually happens in most cases is people just test less and less of their code, it gets worse and worse, and then eventually you have that exciting party known as the big rewrite. Uh, I, I don't think that's a great way to work. I'm in favor of automated testing. So now, uh, controlling your pace is the number one, uh, another one of these things that managers often don't believe. But uh, there's a lot of research to indicate that like, if next week, if Monday you guys go back to work and your boss is like, okay, we got this big thing, everybody's on 60-hour weeks until it's done. In your first week, your first two weeks, you will get a fair bit of productivity boost from this. Everybody will be jazzed up. Like, you'll stop doing laundry, you'll see your family less, you'll skip the gym. Like, all the urgent things you do when something urgent is going on will happen. Uh, but that productivity boost declines over time, and so at some point, and uh, the particular study I was borrowing from here is you know, like around four weeks, uh, your productivity is back to where it was. So that in your 60-hour weeks, you were doing 40 hours of work. And then after that, it only gets worse. You get to that stage where everybody is there all the time, nobody is working very hard, you know, they're doing all of those uh, deferred tasks that they put off, uh, trying to sneak them in online, they're reading a lot of Slashdot and Hacker News, they're you know, sneaking off to the bathroom just so that they can have a little quiet time away from all the annoying people that they can't stand anymore. All the terrible like project failure behaviors. The way, uh, like having been through this, we were uh, very focused on not making this mistake. And luckily my co-founder had three children under five. And so there was no way he could work 60 or 70 hour weeks without uh, ending up going home and getting murdered by his wife which definitely reduces startup outcomes if your CEO gets killed. So uh, we had core working hours. Everybody showed up at the same time. We were pair programming types. And so it was very easy to notice when we were getting tired. And so we would knock off when we were tired, which was by and large the end of a normal working day. So the third point about the maintainability of the code base is a little weird. And since I have a number of non-programmers here, I want to explain something that is very counterintuitive about code. If you think for a moment of manufacturing, uh, you've got your receiving dock at one end, a bunch of materials coming on trucks, and you unload them. You've got some sort of manufacturing line where people do stuff to the raw materials, and then you put your finished products in boxes, and off they go. Now, in a typical manufacturing workflow, like each one of these operations, it's not perfect. So you start out with 100% good parts, and you work your way down, so maybe you've got 98% good parts by the end of it. One customer in 50 gets an unpleasant surprise, but that's okay. You give them a free one and you give them a coupon for 50% off and everybody's happy. Does this make sense so far to people as a workflow? So the thing that is totally different about code is that this truck is this truck. Uh, my raw materials today as a coder are the things I produced yesterday. And so if I started out as 98% good, 
once we've gone through and touched it all, then suddenly it's 96% good, and 94% good, and 92% good, and on down to the stage where nobody is producing anything of value, and again, hooray, big rewrite. Six months of excitement for everybody, no productivity for users, everybody is sad. Now, the only way that you can make code sustainable long term, uh, like even 100% isn't good enough because errors and variants, you can never be at 100%. Your code will quality will always decline unless each time you touch it, you make it better. So a, a model of quality control for code doesn't even make sense. It has to be a model of continuous improvement of the code base if you want it to survive. There were a lot of practices that we used to make that happen. Uh, I would love to talk about them all, but uh, the slot being relatively short, I'm only going to talk about uh, a few of these, in particular the first ones. Treating bugs like emergencies, the use of continuous integration and continuous deployments, the controlling of schedule pressure, pressure and weekly retrospectives. So treating bugs like emergencies uh, the basic notion of this is that bugs are not the usual course of things, that every time one happens, you certainly fix it, and you certainly write tests to cover the case that you did not expect. But much more importantly, you stop and say, like, oh, well, how did, how did that happen? How did we miss that one? And then once you've looked at the things you've missed to say, oh, well, what other bugs are probably in the code base right now that we, never, we haven't even noticed yet? Like, how many times did we make that mistake before now? And then once you've solved that, the question is like, oh, well, how do we stop making these same mistakes again? And you'll never get to perfection, but if you really take each bug seriously, you will find that you have very few bugs to deal with, and you can devote a lot of time and attention to focusing on. The uh, next thing that was really important to us was continuous integration and continuous deployment. This was uh, a spare laptop we had set up as our build monitor in our space. Uh, the way we worked was that uh, a pair would sit down and be working on something. We would commit code every few hours, and then every time we committed, all the tests would run, and as, uh, if the code worked, it would go live. Uh, and it almost always worked. Now, this means that there was no manual QA except things that the programmers did while they were working on it. And so we got very good at turning to product management, like, hey, hey, Paul, come here and check this out. Uh, but there was a lot more stuff that just went live, and he would look at it after it was released. So in our process, QA, if we had it, often came after release. Uh, and that blew my uh, co-founder's mind the first two days we did that. I had to really talk him into trying that. And then after that, it was normal business, and he had no idea why people did it any other way. Controlling schedule pressure is a much harder thing, especially for engineers. It's not an engineering thing, really. Uh, for us, the biggest thing we did was to stop doing dates and to stop estimating anything other than by, like, oh, this is kind of big, Paul. Uh, our units of work were on the order of a day each, and so uh, we would break anything large down into smaller chunks, uh, often as a, uh, also along the way trying to find hidden hypotheses that we needed to test. And because we had dropped dates and dropped estimates, there was just this long list of work. The product manager could change the order of work at any point, any time he felt something new or important had to happen. And then uh, we would work on it one unit at a time. This is not realistic for everybody. Some people actually need dates, in which case you can add estimates back to this approach. But for me, the number one thing in controlling schedule pressure is never to put a date together with a feature set. Uh, always have your dates be something where uh, you can be fuzzy about scope, meet that commitment very early in the process, and then keep adding on to it. Uh, and then the most important of them, really, as uh, we were discussing at lunch with uh, Dave there, was the power of retrospectives. Every week, we would crack open some beers on Friday afternoon uh, and talk about how things went. We would talk about the things that were like, oh, that was great. Like, uh, Heather, when you did that, it was awesome. Uh, we would talk about the things that puzzled us and try to get at them. We would certainly talk about bugs or systemic issues. Every week, we aim to make the next week just a little bit better. And you know, really, if you are making it just 1% or 2% better every week, then suddenly like, you are twice as awesome every year. Uh, those little improvements really add up, and I encourage people to do them assiduously, and to track the things that you want to improve 
a chunk of our whiteboard reser was reserved for retrospective outcomes that then the next week we'd be like, oh, how did we do on solving that problem? So for a lot of people, this doesn't make sense until they can see how it looked physically. So I've got a few slides of this particular startup. Uh, we had a relatively small workspace. You'll note that we all sat physically close together, that we had a lot of wall space, which we put to good use, uh, and that uh, like that wall space was covered with product sketches, competitive stuff, uh, notions about the future, notions about our users. Uh, you can see our happy little user personas right there at the top. We were big fans of pair programming. Uh, unless somebody was out sick, there were always two eyes on every line of code, or two pairs of eyes, four eyes on every line of code being written. We had no one-eyed coders. Uh, <laughs> And this is one of these things that sounds insane to a lot of people. Uh, I personally wouldn't develop software where quality mattered any other way at this point. Uh, as a developer, I really feel like I get third draft code in first draft time. And as a manager, I know how badly poorly written code can impact an organization. And so having stuff that, like, knowing that everything in the code base is relatively trustworthy, knowing that at least, at least two people know everything about everything, uh, it makes it so much easier. Uh, for example, vacations. I mean, we were a startup, venture-funded, desperate for things to work. But when people wanted to take a vacation, we'd be like, oh, you know what, Eric? You do need a week off. Like, get the hell out of here. And it was never any problem because there was no uh, silo for, siloing for knowledge. Uh, we also did all of our planning using index cards on a wall board. Uh, now I look at this and I'm like, oh, was, that's too many cards. So if that's the feeling you're having, you're probably right. Uh, but at the time, uh, the product manager really liked, like, the, it, was, it was a way for him to express the future and kind of think about the future. And so most of these are kind of irrelevant. But um, time here is the long term is on the left, the short term stuff is on the right. The recent past, the last four weeks or so, we would keep a record of uh, the things we'd finished. And often we would use that, like, oh, well, you know, like, oh, what, what happened last week? Or when did we do that? Or like, boy, last week, like, last week didn't seem very productive. Why was that? Those kinds of questions we'd turn there. Uh, things that were done this week, we would keep in a column to the right there. This was our main focus. It was what was going on right at the moment. We had three columns there. One of them was uh, what, we were, what was actually in progress. One was things that were on hold, that you know, say we're coding on something and we needed external information or like we had a, uh, somebody had to get back to us about an a API access. Stuff would end up on hold. And then there was a done column. And you'll notice that all of those are limited to three cards in size. Uh, for us, maintaining that lim those limits on work and process were extremely important to us. Uh, for example, if the done column got backed up, that was a sign that our product manager wasn't doing things quickly. And we were like, oh, hey, Paul, what can we take off your plate to give you more time? Or if there was a lot of on hold stuff, that was a sign of some business issue. And then we very rarely had problems with in progress stuff because we were all pretty disciplined about uh, focus. This area here was the near future. And we spent, uh, like, we looked at this every day as a group in the stand up meeting, and we would have a weekly planning discussion around it. Uh, the product manager spent a ton of his time like thinking and fiddling with this based on things he was learning from experiments, feedback from users, feedback from investors. Uh, from a developer's point of view, it was relatively transparent. Like the top left card, uh, as Heather is picking up here, like that's where you go to get a new thing. And so we would discuss this, but it was not from a developer's perspective, it was not a big deal what happened there. And then we had a far future where the product manager had a giant backlog of stuff. And in fact, down here we, it was the area known as the pit of nice ideas. We're like, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's make sure we don't lose it. And we would put it down there and by and large never touch it again. Uh, and that did make us feel better that our ideas were somewhere and not lost. But were I to do this again, I would try start throwing this stuff away and being more disciplined about limiting the backlog. And then we would track our experiments. These were questions like, oh, does this interface work better than that interface? Uh, what's the right user group? All sorts of things that were long run experiments we would track over there in various stages. So wrapping up, sustainability, I feel like is vital to a lean startup, vital to any startup, really. Uh, 
that you always you have to be very disciplined in deciding which code is temporary and which code is permanent. Know whether what you're doing is an experiment where you're going to throw it away at the end of an experiment or something that you plan to keep maybe forever. Uh, and there are no in-between uh, cases there. There's only temporary and permanent. Because you guys know the third kind of code? Yes. Victory. Uh, and then for sustainability, invest in automated testing. Manage your pace for long-term for long-term productivity, not short-term productivity, and focus on the quality and the maintainability of the code. So that's all I had, but uh, I've got time for questions if you have them. Yes. So sometimes when you, when you keep coding, you just want to you're in the zone and you just want to keep coding. How does it work with your sustainability? So the first time, yeah, no. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I feel like for me, being in the zone is symptomatic. Like the experience for me there is keeping a lot of state in my head. And so the number one thing I did was like in test-driven development, I shift a lot of that state out into my unit tests. And if you're pair programming, a lot of the state is shared between two people. So there's less necessary for this kind of like, I am the god of all things, and I can't walk away to pee or I'll forget them, uh, which is my experience there. And uh, you know, like the first like. That's the kind of coder I used to be, but the thing that really woke me up to that was a group, got it, some extreme programming conference. They were like, oh yeah, if people are allowed to come in and code after hours all they want, and then the first thing we do in the morning is throw that away and build it properly, because it's always full of bugs. And when I started looking at the code I would produce at 3 in the morning, I'm like, oh yeah. I, like, I was not the genius I thought I was. I was just getting more and more tired. Uh, and so I, you know, like, kind of like drunk driving, like sleepy coding is terrible. So by and large, I just don't do that anymore in the code base. I will like stay up and like sketch ideas and have visions, but uh, I don't commit it anymore. Yes, Dave? Oh, no, no. There was all sorts of stuff we wouldn't test, or we would test minimally, because we knew like we would put in some sort of experiment, drive 10,000 users to it, and then throw it out again the next day. And so for us, manual verification was plenty. Uh, and you know, like, often these quick experiments were even hard to test. And so to test them properly, we would have had to refactor a bunch of stuff and then like unrefactor it two days later. So we only in, like, would make something maintainable if we would decide we were going to keep it. Uh, temporary code would sometimes end up tested, be tested anyhow, just because that was the fastest way to get it out the door. Especially like tricky algorithms, we would test. But by and large, uh, we would be, we would go wild in a very tiny, isolated sandbox that we were very disciplined about cleaning up right away. Yeah, and you have, you have to do that, or like. You end up with a sad, sad mess, and you have to throw away the code. Let's see exactly. I'm sorry. Yes. So for me, a lot of these practices are about supporting particular business practices. Uh, I feel like agile software development is really not business focused, and then when you add in customer development suddenly you've got business practices that go with the Agile practices. And so if you can get your business people to discover the value of experiments and be like, oh, hey, we don't have to build this six-month system. Let's do a one-week experiment and see. Suddenly you're giving them something, and they'll be like, oh, yes. What, what can I do to save, save six months on my schedule? What can I do to make sure this product won't fail? And so if you can arrange a quid pro quo, I think that's great. The other thing I do is just not tell people, like the the developers, I get together with the developers, and they go, hey, we're doing this thing. And we won't tell the bosses, because they won't understand. They're just going to know that bugs are going to go down. So uh, tests, how about tests? But that's much harder, because if people find out, they're like, why are you wasting all this time writing extra code? So it depends a lot on your working relationship with your the business partners. So I've got time for maybe one more question. Yeah. OK. One more. Or no more. OK. No more. Well, thank you, folks, and feel free to get in touch. <laughs>